Welcome to The Good, the Bad, and the Uncanny, and we are exploring the Older Testament this year at Westminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Matt Skinner. Margaret Fox is here with me, and we have a guest, a longtime friend of mine, a very accomplished scholar, Brent A. Strawn, the Reverend Dr. Brent A. Strawn, who is at Duke University, which you might have heard of, in Durham, North Carolina, where he serves as the D. Moody Smith Distinguished Professor of Old Testament and Professor of Law. I want to know more about that down the road. Oh, but wow. Brent has uh, written a, a number of books, and one of the ones that might be most interesting for people watching this video is titled The Old Testament is Dying, A Diagnosis and Recommended Treatment. Brent, thanks for being with us. We should start right away. Like The Old Testament is dying. Uh, what happened? What should we do? Who did it? <laughs> who's, who's responsible? What do you mean by that? What's tell us a bit about yeah. your concern about the Old Testament and its neglect? It was Professor Plum in the pantry or something, right, or whatever <laughs> the, the the clue the clue movie says, or the game before that. For those of who are, us who are old enough to remember the board game, um, yeah, I think there's actually lots of guilt to go around in the decline of the Old Testament, and in the book, I I argue or or try to argue that ultimately. Uh, the concern I have is not just with the Old Testament's decline, but really the decline of Scripture in lots of pockets of Christianity, uh, North American, maybe primarily because that's my my area and my familiarity. But but I think uh, it's also widely uh, attested elsewhere, particularly the Old Testament um, and its decline. So and it's longstanding. I mean, um, you know it. It goes back to, in many ways, very early stages in church history with uh, the arch heretic Marcion in the second century, who thought we could just make it just fine without the Old Testament. And uh, even though he was eventually denounced, his churches lasted for a long time, and his ghost still haunts many a Christian's house or many a church hallway. So um, it's a it's a big problem. It's longstanding. It it didn't happen overnight, and uh, but it seems to me to be particularly pronounced in in recent years, maybe even most especially the last century, in in particular ways. And uh, I think it's enough that we ought to be seriously concerned, not with just literacy. Does people do people know X, Y, or Z about the Bible? But but really with biblical mortality, can the Bible sort of perish from Christian experience? Um, and I I fear that it has it, it already perished in many Christians' experience. So that's my concern in the book. And the, di the diagnosis is bleak. The recommended treatment hopefully offers some, some remedies, uh, but we'll see, right? Is the recommended treatment exposure therapy? <laughs> partly it yeah. partly is and and sort of immersion i mean i i use a primary i mean obviously the the book has this sort of medical metaphor in the title but but the real meat of the book that kind of generates its imagination is this is an, a linguistic analogy like you know can is christian faith like a language and is uh christian scripture like a language that we who are trying to be faithful must learn and if that's the case, then it's a second language that's going to be hard to master. And we're going to have lots of difficulty mastering it if we're past a certain age and our brains aren't as plastic and flexible as they used to be. And uh, and we're going to need lots of practice. We're going to need immersion. We're going to need um, to learn the language, to, 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 to kind of have inputs and also outputs, you know, language lab, as it were, uh, to, to learn how to speak the language of scripture. And I think that's a generative metaphor. It has been for me in my teaching and in both the seminary classroom and in continuing education with ministers and so forth. And also with, with lay people, that understanding of kind of a language that we have to learn, but it's difficulty. And what happens if we don't learn it well? Or what happens if we don't learn it at all? Um, that, that really has um, immediate kind of ramifications and connections with people. They realize what's at stake. That's so the thing I like about that. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, just one more observation about that that metaphor is that it's communal, right? Language mm -hmm. is something that only exists in, uh, you know, in exchange with other people right. within a community. So that's right. And 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 to continue that point, linguists would tell us language is a spoken phenomenon. You know, it's not mm -hmm. just a written thing. Most languages in the world are not written. And if you kind of plot it on a 24 hour continuum, the writing of language comes at the very, you know, late in the 11th hour, as it were. Um, PM. 
And so practicing, speaking, uh, you know, the kind of doing of the language, not just recording it or parsing it or something like that is really, is really crucial. My question is, so what does that look like in practice? In other words, what's the difference between literacy, like knowing the stories, like how many children did Jacob have, you know, and those kinds of questions. And do you know the story of Abigail? I mean, it's, it's, that, that I would say is literacy, right? Can you, can you do well in jeopardy versus mm -hmm. the okay. kind of, the kind of fluency that you're interested in? Yeah. Like, what does that look like in practice for ordinary people? How are they speaking the language of scripture, I guess, in their, in their lives and their conversations in church hallways? So in answer to your question, Matt, I don't know if, I know I actually don't have a definitive answer, but for me, uh, I think about the language analogy as helpful because I think language is one of the primary ways we negotiate, understand, make sense of the world. And so if scripture is part of that, then we have a scriptural lens to make sense of the world, a grammar by which to see life, make sense of life, our own lives amidst other lives. I think it's Rakur who said something like, um, language is the primary way that human beings resist the world as it has been given to them. And so if acquiring scripture as a second language matters, then it's a way we resist our first mother tongue, whatever that may be. Um, but it's not faith. It's it's not scripture. And if we don't have that scriptural language in place, then we can't resist. We, we can't. And it's not only just resistance. For me, it's recognition. Where is the spirit at work? How would I know um, if I don't have the language of scripture present? So um, it's not a matter, as you say, of, of simple Bible facts or trivia. I'm really not interested in that. But but livability and uh sensibility and i know for like for example for me i think an e example would be when someone encounters something on the news like a matter of public policy they actually might think of something in scripture first and foremost rather than just what the pundit said um on the news a moment ago uh, they might actually ponder oh what does Ruth, the book of Ruth, have something to say about that? Or what about Jonah? Or let alone Jesus in some parable, you know? Yeah. So for me, that's the kind of lens I want Christians to have, that their imagination is shaped fundamentally by scripture and not just by their latest and uh, most favorite musician or or whatever. Sure. And if we don't do that, do we become a social club? Do we lose connection to traditions? I mean, what's the... I, I mean, I think so. What happens I mean, if it you, dies? You, you can ask. You can ask other. I mean, other people give you different answers, but sure. I've come to to believe that Christianity is a book religion. I mean, that's not me. That's every, everybody says that. Maybe more than that, but it's certainly not less than that. And so, if you lose the book, you're losing a big deal. I mean, you're losing. It's the major script that the church has for millennia. Said that's the lodestar. That's that's where we look. It's difficult, right? It's ancient. It's complicated, and it comes in a singularly unhelpful form for writing policy or polity. Right? I mean, you know, no one writes polity on the basis of poems or parables or whatever. So it's got some strikes against it. But the church has always said, that's the place. That's the place in a special way. There might be other places where God speaks to us as well, other ways. Not as clearly, though. Um, and not as directly as this way. And so if we lose that way, then we're, we're losing a whole lot. Um, and I think that we are actually unmoored from, from uh, Christianity. It's in its historic um, forms, for sure. I'm wondering if you could talk about the, the Old Testament in particular. You, you referred at the beginning to, to this impulse of Christians sometimes to disregard or devalue this part of our scripture, tracing it all the way back to Marcion. So I'm wondering if you could say sort of what's behind that impulse? Why is this um why is this set of texts or this 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 part of our scripture viewed as as suspect or sometimes considered less than? Yeah. I mean I Matt might want to weigh in here too with some of the early Christian writings before Marcion. We get we get some, you know, very early dissension between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians and then uh, as the church becomes more and more Gentile, even more dissension between the Gentile church and the Jewish synagogue, much to our great um, embarrassment, you know, uh, in the Christian church. 
So that kind of rift and problem is is deep. Um, the cut goes way back. Um, you know, for someone like Marcion and his ghost is with us still, the issue is a kind of, um, you know, sense that certain parts of the Old Testament have been have abrogated or obsolete in light of things the New Testament says. So one of his great writings was called the Antitheses, where he sort of set one Old Testament text and then its antithesis in the New Testament. And of course, the New Testament was right. Um, so in my book, I talk about this as as as... Marcy and kind of bringing in another analytic to judge, as it were, between the biblical texts. And in his judgment, that analytic maybe was logical consistency, maybe it was his own understanding of who God is. It just allowed him to discern this is right, this is wrong. Um, the early church writers against Marcion had a different analytic, a different understanding. And theirs was that the scripture was of a piece. Uh, and together contributed um, to the to the most robust and healthy vision of God. So uh, it's Tertullian in particular who who goes after Marcion and says, you know, when Marcion does this, when Marcion throws out the Old Testament, uh, he ends up, um, you know, basically going wrong on everything from God to creation uh, to uh, Christology, soteriology. Everything goes awry because he's severed. The Old Testament from the New Testament. Um, so I think what Marcion has seen, though, and his more recent descendants have as well, and, and others too who aren't Marcionite per se, is the real difficulties that live in the Old Testament. We, we, we can think of violence, we can think of uh, gender matters, we can think of all sorts of issues. Um, the problem, of course, is that those issues, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, um, more, et cetera. Those don't live only in the Old Testament. And, you know, Marcion sort of pretended that they did. And a lot of other more recent critics of the Old Testament think the same. They sort of live over there. Uh, but Matt could regale us, I'm sure, with the fact that they don't live only in the Old Testament. And so I've come to believe that when people start giving me an earful, as an Old Testament professor, what's wrong with the Old Testament, I really realized not only are they illiterate about the Old Testament, they're really illiterate about the New Testament as well. And that's why I think if the Old Testament dies, the New Testament isn't far behind. Uh, what Marcion gave up on, when he gave up the Old Testament, he had to give up on, on a good bit of New Testament stuff as well. And we see that in other more recent problems that people have raised about the Old Testament. So, you know, again, if we give up on the Old Testament, we're giving up a whole lot of stuff that the New Testament writers deemed precious and actually indispensable. Um, so those problems, in other words, this is kind of coming back to your question, those problems of, of judgment or wrath or violence or whatever, they're thoroughly biblical problems. They're not just Old Testament problems, they're biblical problems. They're real, especially for us moderns. But the only way to, to address them is to think them through together testamentally rather than to sort of pawn them off. And so the real one of the answers, not the real answer, but one of the answers I would give to your question is I, I think that we have some some deep seated psychological reasons that we off put stuff over there, uh, kind of projecting it. Oh, we don't we don't we don't have that violent stuff here in the church it must be over there and it's not just in the bible it's over there in the old testament and so it's not really part of the church um but in fact it's it's all it's all in there we have to think it through which means that the old testament has real resources to address some of those problems it's not just a uh you know the generator of the problem it also provides solutions to the problem and the new testament also has instances of the problem and also has uh solutions and together they can contribute to each other uh to a better i think more healthy way of thinking about these matters that's a real important point i think the one about not just the generator of the problem, that within a testament, within the Bible as a whole, within a single individual biblical book, sometimes yeah. you find yeah. the remedy or you find the critique, the criticism yeah. of mm -hmm. the the atrocity or the the thing that God does that might seem out of character for you or something like that. Right. So it's not it's not just our modern sensibilities, right, which we think are so yeah. somehow you know sophisticated or advanced that cause us to see moral. <laughs> something morally alarming. Yeah. The book itself sometimes will take us there, which in some ways turns yeah. the question now to something more positive, which is, right, what's gained when Christians read the Old 
Testament and yeah. well in it, which like, I'm sure when you teach, you don't just apologize the whole time and say, it's oh, not that bad no, folks, no. really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like apologize for very long, though I do always talk about sort of, I, I at least in the int my intro classes, I sort of name early on, I think the first day of class, four big problems that we're going to kind of take up. And one is violence and one is the wrath or judgment of God, stuff like that. Um, but I also have, yeah, four gifts. I mean, there's more than this, but sure. but the gifts that I talk about in my introductory class um, include things like honesty, uh, poetry, uh, ecclesiology, and theology. So I, I'd say those four things take a hit if we don't have the Old Testament. So uh, I don't know what the best order is. Let's let's start with uh, poetry. I mean, something like a third or more of the Old Testament is poetry, and there's very little of that in the New Testament. And where it is concentrated in the New Testament, it's often sort of dependent on the Old Testament, whether it's citations or the book of Revelation, right? So uh, not everybody likes poetry. In fact, poetry is in significant decline as well. But poetry is a signal contribution of the Old Testament to Christian scripture, suggesting there are, are things to say about God that just can't be said simplistically or straightforwardly mm -hmm. uh, you've got to say them imagistically you got to say them metaphorically uh you got to say tell them slant to quote emily mm -hmm. dickinson you you just god's hard to get said right you know so you gotta you gotta go around it in multiple ways and poetry is sort of the best highest articulation of of the most literate among us to speak truth and um, and to talk around a subject in a way that somehow we can identify with and even as it sort of eludes us. So poetry is a, a crucial contribution. Honesty is another one. Poetry is oftentimes very candid literature. The Old Testament is very candid. The New Testament is too, of course, right, Matt? But but there's something about the brutal candor of the, of the Old Testament that just cannot be, you know, ignored i mean when it when when it when the old testament tells you about these these violent moments or these profound moments of of disobedience uh that's just remarkable candor christians are sometimes tempted to use though to weaponize those stories i think against israel but in point of fact we only know them because israel's been so candid and honest in sharing them with us um their failures as well as their triumphs so that is but in really quick and say, you've crazy. got a different audience in the New Testament, which is much more yeah. geographically uh, dispersed. Yeah. But also they don't have that shared identity as a nation for the most part. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, I think the, the the Hebrew Bible texts, at least they're talking to people who they're kind of stuck with each other, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and maybe that relates to the ecclesiology point. Yeah. I mean, I think that... Uh, the corporate nature of the Old Testament is really inescapable um, in a way that many people have found conveniently and wrongly ways to escape the corporate nature of the New Testament. Um, the, the Old Testament is just sort of irreducibly corporate. You know, we're in it together. Uh, few are guilty. All are held responsible, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a very high ecclesiology, as it were, in the in the Old Testament. And for me, that ecclesiological point is really one way Christians can can read themselves into the Old Testament, that what God says to the people of, of, of God initially is what God also continues to say to the people of God belatedly, that is the, the church. Um, and then the last one I think would be theology. The uh, the Old Testament is is often thought to be sort of, you know, traditionally, if you have to pick, you know, extensive testimony to the first member. And um, that's the uh, first member of the Trinity. And so, so that, you might need to uh, define that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> like God, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit, uh, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Um, that 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 first member um, is, you know, kind of present in a special way. Right. Just like the spirit and the and the, and the son are special in a present way, spe present in a special way in the New Testament. So the, the theology business is really crucial. We get a very, very robust depiction of God in the Old Testament, uh, one that surpasses, in my judgment, any, any other ancient Near Eastern deity of any sort. Um, interior life of God, thoughts of God, um, you know, the feelings of God. And this God is very complicated. Um, and this God is uh, very 
mysterious and very, um, what, not to our liking a lot of times. Um, and I think I've grown to, to believe that that's something that I don't, I no longer need to apologize for, but that I sort of celebrate um, that uh, God is, God's godness is on display in the Old Testament in a way that just cannot be trifled with. And uh, that might be for me, it's it's ultimate contribution to my own personal spirituality is wrestling with that God who is so beyond uh, me and certainly beyond my control, let alone my my abilities to understand. So those are a couple couple gifts for those are all good gifts. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. So uh, Matt, I've got a question here. I don't know if you're going to like this one or not. I just I just thought of it. But um, Brent, <laughs> if you were <laughs> If what matters is, does Brent like it? Does Brent like it? It's true. <laughs> it so it starts, it starts by saying, right, if, if you were a YouTuber, right, if you were yeah. on BookTube and you needed to give us a book trailer for the Older Testament and say, here's what it's about, here's why you should read it, what, what would mm -hmm. you say? I mean, what are when, when people read this book, what are they going to find there? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's a great question. Um I haven't I haven't thought about things like in that way, but um, I think what I would say, I mean, there's obvious things you could talk about the story of God with the world or God's ways with Israel. Um, not all that's true. Um, I think I want to even a simple preview, you know, a, a preview for folks of what they'll yeah. what they'll see and what they'll encounter in reading this yeah. book this summer. <laughs> Coming to a theater <laughs> near you, <laughs> the God of Israel <laughs> presents. You know, um, I I guess I'd say what we will find there is the uh, mysterious ways of God in the world. Um, God incarnate in Israel before God incarnate in Christ in the New Testament, uh, showing a better way in the world than in a more honest way than what we we presently have on offer um a very uh tricky way uh unclear way at times again uh difficult for us to get our minds around but something that will repay reading and more reading and rereading uh and in that sense for me the ultimate uh, metaphor for scripture is 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 poetry rather than 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 story because I think with poetry, we expect that we won't get it the first time and that we're going to have to keep coming back to it. And it might continue to, to kind of yield its secrets slowly over time and, and upon rereading. So I would call the, the Bible really the, the poem, poem of God or the poetry of God. And, uh, and that means that what we'll find is both you know, remarkably affective, speaking to us, uh, in affecting us and affecting our emotions. Uh, and also profoundly, hopefully inspiring and uh, evocative and just uh, calling us forth um, to come back to it again and again. So I, I, it's a little too long maybe and doesn't have enough hooks, but I'll work on it. I'll work. <laughs> I, I said YouTube, not TikTok. So you're fine. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> If it was TikTok, you'd have to dance as well, Brent. Yeah, I know. Right. I was thinking about that. What would I do? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. And that's slightly connected to, I think, what you just answered about poetry, because you also teach in the law school there, don't you? You're a mm -hmm. professor of law. And so a lot of people would say, I look at the Old Testament as a book full of law and yeah. regulation. I mean, I think that's one of the, the caricatures of it. Yeah. So what's going on with that approach? <laughs> Mm. that you've taken in particular you love the poetry but you also have yeah. an interest in uh i assume you have interest in law yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> well one thing i think that's helpful about the law school and theology school connections is that and and it relates to any of the real professional schools but practice ones like medicine as well is that so much depends in the field of bible and theology on really close, granular attention to details, you know? Um, and one of the great, and, and poets do that. I mean, it's, isn't it, uh, it's Mary Oliver who says, you know, how to, how to live, instructions for life is to sort of pay attention, be astonished and tell someone about it. You know, it's just a great little three steps for being a good poet too. Um, so that lives in poetry, but, but in the, in the, in the Old Testament, the Torah, 
is sort of sort of really hit me when I was working on the skin disease passages in Leviticus, which I mean, everybody loves those passages. <laughs> Who doesn't love those passages? They're oh. great. They're everybody's favorite. So I know all your listeners are thoroughly familiar with them, but just in case they're not, <laughs> there's this thing called skin disease. Leprosy is how it's sometimes translated. But when it happens, um, the priests are instructed with very specific instructions on how to how to attend to this. And it depends on if it's penetrated the skin in this sort of way, or if the hair is white, or I mean, it's just, it's wild. And it's a little bit disgusting too. And you learn that this particular type of skin disease doesn't just affect people, it affects, it can get in the walls of a house, it can afflict uh, clothing, items of clothing and bags. What is this thing? Who knows exactly? It may even be a spiritual malady rather than a physical one. But what's for sure is that the priests have to gear up and know what they're talking about if they're going to make the crucial distinction between clean and unclean. And clean and unclean in that text is about life with God or life sequestered from God. You know, it's a life and death kind of thing. And so this, this attention to detail, this close analysis of, of, of details, text, the world, to me, that's, that's hermeneutics, you know, and, and it works in law and it works in theology. It works in legal discourse and it also works in, in poetic discourse. Um, but I definitely think you're right, Matt, that, that so many Christians, unfortunately, operate with kind of the character of Scripture, particularly the Old Testament, but maybe maybe even all of it as a rule book or whatever. And uh, and that's where I would hope that the courses like this that y'all are doing will just help people see this just unbelievable, fascinating resource for the life of faith, which is anything but boring, you know, anything but boring. And anything but like a simplistic manual of do this and do that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even the Ten Commandments. Oh, so specific, so clear, so unclear. I mean, right? What, is, what does it mean to don't kill or or is it don't murder? What what does yeah? You know, what does that mean? Well, we gotta have additional law to help figure us figure that out because it's it's up for negotiation. It's up for interpretation. Brent, this is a great conversation. We appreciate the energy and the insight you bring to all of this. And I think now we're going to have to figure out who's going to teach on skin diseases when we get to Leviticus, but <laughs> Margaret and I will work that out and we'll do it's some It's going to be a competition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love the skin disease passages. Love it. <laughs> I tell this, this will maybe the last thing I should say, but say is, is explain that in a little bit. Is I always tell my students, if you can try to think through the worst passages or most tricky, well, the other stuff's easy. So why not go after the tricky <laughs> stuff like skin disease or violence, you know? I mean, just go for it. Then the other stuff, Psalm 23, psh, come on, easy. Exactly right. <laughs> or when God just makes a promise and you're like, okay, I can wait that yeah. one out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Brent. No, thank you for having me on and uh, hope it goes well and, and Godspeed to you and your listeners in this study.